How are you, man? Hi, everyone. I'm good. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really good. Glad oh, to be here. Happy to have you, man. You've been shooting in Canada for a bit, right? I have. I've been in Toronto Pinewood for about five months. What can you, what can you tell us I'm about Pacific Rim? I'm a native. I love it. You love it. That's right. <laughs> can you, what can you say about Pacific Rim? Can you talk about it? Uh, yeah, Guillermo del Toro. Um, he did, you know, Pan's Labyrinth. He's a hellboy. He's an amazing director. And, uh, you know, I was... He called me and said, this is a true story. He said, listen, uh, Tom Cruise doesn't want to do it, so I want you. <laughs> um, Just like that? I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. But uh, do you feel more or less pressure to take a role like that if it comes with the caveat that Tom Cruise said no? <laughs> um, actually, I'm not sure if that was a rumor or a joke. You know, Guillermo del Toro has a, a, a huge sense of humor. But, yeah, of course, you know, the role was a coveted role, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Tom would have loved to have done it. I'm sure they tried to work it out or whatever. But, um, yeah, the fact that, you know, you know, someone as big as Tom Cruise could have been playing this role, and here I am, uh, it does add a certain sort of uh, responsibility almost, you know? Sure. Good, uh, good sci-fi has to have a message behind it. Yeah. That's the art to good sci-fi. Yeah. That's important for, for your choices and films you make? Yeah, I think, you know, the films that I, I'm, I'm leaning towards, you know, like, you know, for most actors, you, you don't get to choose your roles. You know, you get a job, you work it, and you move on. Uh, and as, you know, you know, I sort of climb the ladder a little bit, I get to choose roles. So now I'm choosing films that have something to say. It's important, you know, if I'm going to spend two and a half hours watching a movie or an hour or whatever, I want a message from it. So, uh, and this film, it, although it's a huge sci-fi movie, it does a re really great human story in it. The, um, speaking of a movie with a message, you're going to play Nelson Mandela. That, that's, that's some heavy duty, right? <laughs> Very. Yeah, I, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to play Nelson. Have you ever met him? Like, no. Will you get to meet him? I think I will get to meet him. That's... And he knows that I'm playing the part. <clears throat> and uh, there's a great story that the director, Justin Chadwick, told me. He said uh, he had the privilege of meeting Winnie Mandela and uh, Nelson's two daughters. And he said, he played the guessing game. He said, guess who's going to play your dad? And they all looked at each other and went, is it Idris Elba? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> Winnie Mandela knows me? That's amazing. Do you think and, she knows uh, you from Luther or from The Wire? Um, I think it's Tyler Perry's film, Daddy's Little Girl. I really? think it's one of her favorite films. So uh, <laughs> That's an interesting that's place incredible. to be. Yeah. You know, um, you're getting this opportunity to go and play in this iconic figure. You've also had the, the joy of being an iconic guy in American television, and then you've been an, an, building an iconic role with Luther in, in England. What's mm. your relationship like with the Stringer Bell thing? Because I've interviewed a lot of people who've played characters before that are memorable, but what, when Michael Kenneth Williams was on the show, when we told people you were coming on the show, people who love The Wire, it's a different relationship right. with the character. What is your relationship with it like now? Yeah, Stringer is, uh, you know, str you know, I, I, play, I played Stringer at a time of my career when, you know, I'd moved to the States and I wasn't working. I was working prior in England, doing well, and then came to the States and didn't get a job for about four years, and Stringer was my lifeline. And then I played Stringer for about three years, and, you know, my relationship with the character with the show is that, first of all, it changed my life. But it continues to sort of like, everywhere I go still, and it's like seven years since I did the show, everywhere I go there are still huge string of fans. And you know, it just, it wows me that I touch so many people, that the writing, the characters in The Wire touch so many people. I mean, it wows me. The, um, the we can't talk about how, what happens to Stringer Bell because it's, it, it's his own story there. But at a certain point when you're in a film like, and a show like that, do you become defiant about your character with the writers? Do you think you know what Stringer needs to be about? And I wonder if it's the same thing with Luther and your new show. Well, yeah, there's a, uh, you know, what happens to Stringer in the, end, in the end, for some people who don't know, but, you know, there's, there's a certain sequence that Stringer goes through in the, third, in the third season, and I remember David Simon and I having a conversation about how we should portray this, and I had to fight. You fought him, eh? I had to. I mean, he, he had a, a certain idea of how Stringer should go out, which, and I was on the same page with him, Stringer should go out. But how 
was uh, we had a little bit of a battle on. And yeah, of course, when, you, uh, when you've sort of worked on a character for three years and you're part owner of that character, you know, you are responsible, you feel like you are responsible for what happens to him. I know when people find out, first of all, that McNulty isn't American and you aren't American, it's a shock to them. So what's it like <laughs> the first time that I heard that you are like, what? When you meet people and then and they go, string a bell, and then you, <laughs> they hear your voice, do you ever ha see a visceral reaction from them? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I said, for about two years after playing Stringer, I had an identity crisis. I, I, didn't know what my, I didn't know what my own accent was. <laughs> you know, but I heard you auditioned with an American accent and the guys didn't even know you were, you were British beforehand. Yeah, no, they did for about, I did four auditions for it over a space of about two months. And it wasn't until the last audition they were like, where are you from? <laughs> you know, do I lie? I've, I've been here three, three times already, do I lie? So I said, oh, I'm from East London, man. And he was like, wow. And then, they, you know, they were really impressed. Is it different for a different experience as a black actor in England as opposed to a black actor in America? What's a black actor? <laughs> um, no, the... <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> No, but I know, obviously, no, yeah. yeah. No, the, the, the experience of, you know, in England, um, although very multicultural, right? Like, like Toronto, actually. Very multiracial and, and, and has a history of that. Wasn't actually represented in television as much. So, you know, we would see, we wouldn't see, you know, Afro-Caribbean people on television and characters as much as we'd like to, as much as we'd seen in, in America. So that was the main difference. However, the actual, you know, finding a job, getting a job, the politics surrounding being a black man in the film industry is all the same all over the world. Um, and, you know, so there was no, I didn't get to America and suddenly it was gravy. In fact, I got to America and didn't work for four years. Right. And, and partly it was because my accent was terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I practiced every day. Like, I lived in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and I just walk around with an American accent the whole time. You were DJing long before you were a famous actor, weren't you? Yeah, I started off DJing as, as, as about 14 years old. My, my uncle was a DJ, and he did weddings and, and christenings, and he dragged me along, and I ended up DJing for him when he had too much to drink, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, and uh, so yeah, but by the time I was 16, I was on like pirate radio um, and DJing in clubs, and I just love doing it, you know? I, I, you know, I do it for the, keeps my, my feet on the ground. Right. And by the way, you know, people, you've been out to clubs, you don't care who the DJ is half the time, you just want to dance, you know, so I love it, I love it, it keeps me alive. Are you involved with the police, Oturi? Not to worry, doll. You just concentrate on doing what you do best, being beautiful. Sublight pizza! Hey. About time, meet you in the bay. Hot delivery anywhere on Altar, guaranteed. Get out of here. <laughs> Amazing. Whoa. Let me tell you. Yeah. That's one of your first TV credits, right? In case you didn't notice, that wasn't my voice. Yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they changed my voice. Apparently my American accent wasn't very good back then. Okay, so let me answer apology. How often do you Google yourself? Uh, uh, mm, uh, I don't Google myself as much as I check pictures. So if I've been to an event, I'll check what I look like. I know it sounds terrible, but it just helps me. Anyway, don't worry about it. <laughs> What's the one record that every DJ should have within arm's reach at all, all times? Um, Michael Jackson, do you want to be starting something? I mean, you've you got to have that. You could play it anywhere. You could play it at a funeral and someone would start dancing. <laughs> What's your go-to karaoke song? Do you have one? Uh, Bob Marley, One Love. So I'm sure it's a question that you faced before, but if Stringer Bell had to fight Luther in a dark alley, who wins? Good question. I think Luther would, I think Luther would beat Stringer. Really? But intellectually, I think Stringer would beat Luther. So what if Idris shows up and yeah. has to get in there? Who wins that fight? Um, I, this is what I would do. I would punch Luther in the mouth, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd do a business deal with Stringer. Who's more intimidating, Beyonce or Jay-Z? Uh, who's more intimidating? Yeah. They're not intimidating people. They're really, really cool people, both of them. And um, Beyonce's so sweet, and Jay's very focused. Who would win in a game of FIFA, you or Noel Gallagher? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd have to say I'd kick Noel's ass. Would you? For sure. <laughs> but but he, he would disagree. By the way, he loves FIFA, and he's really technical about it, but I'm better than him. 
Does playing Nelson Mandela and, and, and being, I mean, your parents are born in Africa. Yeah. Does it take on a different meaning for you? I mean, it's an absolute sort of inheritance by being, you know, African that, you know, to play someone um, like Nelson is, it means a lot to my family, it means a lot to us, uh, uh, my, my countries. I'm half Ghanaian, half Sierra Leonean, and, and the news of me playing Mandela is, is big out there. So, yeah, it means a lot, it definitely means a lot. All right, time for a new feature, which is called Questions for an English Man. When do you feel the most British? Uh, I feel the most British whenever I go to a cafe and order breakfast. Mm -hmm. Because just the way I speak and, you know, can I have a couple of eggs? Can I have them sunny side up? And they always go, what? Which, be which better represents Britain, Queen the Band or Queen the Queen? Queen the Band. Zeppelin or the Who? <laughs> By the way, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. It's true. Zeppelin or the Who? The Who. Dizzy Rascal or the Streets? Dizzy. Which is your favorite Commonwealth country? Hint, hint. <laughs> England! Hit <laughs> yourself, everybody. We'll be right back.